Hi everyone, it's Professor Pemberton. In this video, we're going to finish up our discussion on inverse functions. So if you remember from the previous video, we left off with how do you actually find an inverse function if you don't have the inverse function given? How do you use the horizontal line test to determine whether a graph of a function will have an inverse function or not? How do you use the graph of a one-to-one -one function to graph the inverse function? And then find the inverse of a function and graph both the function and its inverse in the same axes. All right, so let's talk about how to find an inverse function. The definition of the inverse function tells us that the domain of the function f is equal to the range of the inverse and vice versa. So this gives us the idea of how to actually find the inverse function. That means if you have a function f, if it's a set of ordered pairs, x comma y, then we talked about in the previous video that the inverse function will be a set of ordered pairs where you have the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate are reversed. The input becomes the output for the inverse, and the output becomes the input for the inverse. So in other words, if saying x comma y, you can write it this way, y equals f of x, that's just using function notation, so x is your input into the function f, and you get the output y. If you are able to take this equation and solve the equation for x in terms of y, then you get what's called the inverse function. And you'll have the equation look like this. x is equal to some formula or some function in terms of y's, and that turns out to be the inverse function of f. So in other words, what you can do is interchange the x's and the y's in your equation or your formula, and when you solve for y, you find the inverse function. So let's go through the steps on how to find the inverse function. Step one, if you want to find the inverse function and there's function notation being used for f of x, replace it with a y in the equation. It just makes things easier when you have x's and y's only in your equation rather than function notation. Step two, interchange the x's and the y's. This is what makes an inverse relation possible. You take all your inputs, which are x values, for the original function, and you make them output values for the inverse relation, and vice versa for the y values. Step three is the most difficult step of all four of these. Solve the equation for y. After you have x's and y's interchanged, it will not be y equals anymore. It will be x equals. So step three is solve the equation for y. If this equation does not define y as a function of x, the function does not have an inverse function, and you don't have to go to step four. If this equation, after you have y solved for, does define y as a function of x, then you found the inverse function. So then the last step, step four says, if f has an inverse function from the previous step, then you can use the function notation f inverse of x to represent the inverse function, and then you can always check your answer. So remember from the previous video, to verify whether two functions are inverses, you can do composition of f is the outside function and the inverse function of f is the inside function. You should just get x. Or vice versa, if you do f inverse of f of x, you should still get just x. Okay, so example three. We're going to find the inverse function for several different types of functions. So find the inverse function, and then determine the domain and range of both functions, not just f of x, but the domain of f of x and the inverse. So number one, we're gonna start off with the function f of x equals negative three x plus four. So step one, I'm gonna write out the steps in the notes. So step one, replace f of x with y. So there was function notation in the function that's given. So replace it with a y makes it y equals negative three x plus four. So now the equation only has x and the y's. So now the second step, interchange x and y. So this is what makes inverse relations possible. You make all the y's x's and you make all the x's y's. So now you have the equation x equals negative 3y plus 4. Step 3, solve the equation for y. 
and I'm going to say if possible because we know that from reading the steps it may not be possible to define y as a function when you have y solved for. So this is where all the algebraic steps are. First two steps are pretty quick. So now the second step was x equals negative 3y plus 4. We need to get y by itself. So take this equation, subtract the 4 first to both sides of the equation. So you have x subtract 4 is equal to negative 3y. And now divide both sides of the equation by negative 3. So you'll have y is equal to x subtract 4 divided by negative 3. So this equation defines a function because for every input value, there is exactly one output value. So then the last step, step 4, is if there is an inverse function, now you can use function notation to represent the inverse. So the last step is to replace y with f inverse of x. And so that means take the y and make it f inverse of x. And it was x subtract 4 divided by negative 3. So this is the inverse function of the original function f of x. Notice that it's not just the reciprocal as we talked about in the previous video. If you want to find the inverse, you have to go through these four steps. You can't just take 1 divided by negative 3x plus 4. It didn't turn out to be that function. And then keep in mind that you can always check your answer. by verifying that one of the compositions gives you just x. So the inverse on the outside, f of x on the inside, or you can do f of f inverse of x, and either way it should just give you x. If you do get this, then that must be the correct inverse. Okay, and the last thing that we need to do for this first problem is find out the domain and range for both functions, the original function f of x and the inverse. So domain of f so f of x was a linear function, negative 3x plus 4, the slope is negative 3 and the y-intercept is 4. Notice that you're not dividing by x, so you'll never divide by 0, and you'll never be taking a square root or an even root of a negative number. So the domain is the set of all real numbers, so negative infinity to infinity. If you remember from the previous video, we also found out that the domain of f is equal to the range of the inverse function. So we get this for free. You get the range of the inverse is automatically all real numbers. So now, let's find out what the range of f is. It's much easier to find a function's domain using its formula. So, range will leave for a second. It is equal to the domain of the inverse function. So let's look at the inverse. You are dividing by negative 3. So you're never dividing by 0. That's good. And you're never taking an even root of a negative number. So it looks like the domain of the inverse is equal to the range of the function f is also all real numbers. Okay, so let's try a couple more problems. Number 2. This time the function is going to be called g of x, and it is 3 divided by x, and then subtract 1. So notice that there's an x in the denominator, so this is what's called a rational function. We're going to find what the inverse function is, if one exists, by going through the steps again. So step 1, replace the function notation, so replace g of x with y. So that makes it y equals 3 divided by x, then subtract 1. So that makes it much easier to solve for y or x. So step 2, interchange x and y. So that makes it x is equal to 3 divided by y, subtract 1. So those first two steps are pretty quick again. So now step three is where all the algebraic work happens. Solve the equation for y. If possible. All right, so let's see how you get y by itself. Well, notice that y is in the denominator. 
So you can't just divide by y because y is already in the denominator. Let's add 1 to both sides of the equation. So if you do that, you'll have x plus 1 is equal to 3 divided by y. You want to have some way of getting the y out of the denominator. So let's do what we did earlier in the, in the course by multiplying by the least common denominator on both sides of the equation. So multiply the left side of the equation by y. So y times x plus 1. And also multiply the right side of the equation by y. So 3 divided by y times y. So notice that the y divided by y cancel each other out. And so what you have left is y times x plus 1 is equal to 3. And you want to be able to get y by itself. So now divide both sides of the equation by x plus 1. So you want to undo the multiplication. So divide. And you'll get 3 divided by x plus 1. And so it was possible to get y by itself. So that means y defines a function of x. So that means we need to go to step 4 now. Step four is replace the y with the inverse function. So replace y with inverse notation. Well, this function was called g, so this will be g inverse of x. And so the inverse of g of x would be three divided by x plus one. Okay, and again, keep in mind that you can check your answer. by performing composition of the function with its inverse. So you can do g inverse of g of x or g of g inverse of x and you should just get x either way. If you do, then that is the correct inverse function. Okay, so now let's find out the domain and range of both functions. Let's find out what the domain of g is first. So look at the function g, the function that was given. Are there any values of x that you cannot plug in to the function? Well, notice that there's an x in the denominator, so I cannot have 0 in the denominator, so x cannot be 0. But it looks like all the other values are okay, as long as I'm not divided by 0. So negative infinity is 0, parenthesis on 0 because you do not want to include it, and then union 0 to infinity. And that is again automatically the range of the inverse function. Okay, and then if you want to find the range of the function g, find the domain of the inverse. So let's do that. If you want to look at the inverse function, you have 3 divided by x plus 1. What x value can you not substitute into this inverse function? Well, I want to make sure the denominator is not 0, because I have a fraction involved. So x plus 1 cannot be 0 means x cannot be negative 1. So negative infinity to negative 1 union negative 1 to infinity and that is the domain of the inverse function. So you get the range of the inverse for free because you know the domain of g and you get the range of the original function g if you know the domain of the inverse. Okay, let's try one more of these kind of problems. Number three. So we did one linear function, one rational function, and now we're going to do a power function. This time the function is called h of x and it's x subtract 1 to the fifth power. So let's see if we have an inverse function this time. So step 1, replace the function notation. So replace h of x this time with y. So that would make it y equals x minus 1 in parentheses to the fifth. Step 2, interchange x and y. So that makes it x is equal to y minus 1 in parentheses to the fifth power. Now step 3, solve the equation for y. If possible, So let's see what we come up with this time. We had x equals y minus 1 to the fifth. And we want to try to get y by itself. And notice that the y is inside the parentheses being raised to the fifth power. So you want to make sure that you're thinking about inverse functions as they're undoing the operations. So how do you undo the fifth power? 
Well, you can take the fifth root. So take the fifth root on both sides of the equation. So fifth root of x is equal to the fifth root of y minus 1 to the fifth power. So the fifth root of y minus 1 to the fifth just becomes y minus 1. And it equals the fifth root of x. So now we want to get y by itself. So add 1 on both sides of the equation. So y is equal to the fifth root of x. And then add 1 outside the root. So again, this equation is a function of x because y is defining a function. So in the last step, so now with that we know that the function has an inverse, replace y with the inverse notation, which would be h inverse of x this time. So you would have the inverse of h of x would be the fifth root of x, and then add 1. All right, and again, check your answer by performing composition. h inverse of h of x or h of h inverse of x must be equal to x by itself. If you don't just come up with x when you check your answer, then that was not the correct inverse, and you might want to go back and check your work on the four steps. So once we have the inverse function, now we can find out the domain and range. Let's find out the domain of h. So h of x, let's see, are you ever divided by 0? No. Are you ever taking an even root of a negative number? Nope. I only see a positive 5 power. That's an odd power. So the domain is the set of all real numbers, which is the range of the inverse of h. And now find the range of h by finding the domain of the inverse. So let's look at the inverse function. Notice that there is a root this time but it's an odd root. It's the fifth root. You only have to worry about the even roots of negative numbers. So again, this would also be all real numbers because there are no x values to exclude from the domain of the inverse. So this gives you a variety of different types of functions that you can find the inverse for. We have a linear function, a rational function, and then also a power function. So now the last part of the video is talking about how do you associate graphs with having an inverse function. Well, let's talk about what's called the horizontal line test and one-to-one -one functions. So recall that a function provides exactly one output for every input value. So let's look at the function f of x equals x squared. And we know that this is a quadratic function because the highest power on x is a 2. So f of x equals x squared. Let's see if this function has an inverse or not. So let's go through the four steps one more time. So step one, replace the f of x with a y. So that makes it y equals x squared. Step two, interchange x and y. Define the inverse. So that makes the x equals y squared. Step three, solve the equation for y, if possible. So step two gives you the inverse relation. Now we're going to find out, is the inverse relation actually a function? So we have x equals y squared. If you want to get y by itself, you're going to have to use the square root to cancel out the square power. So take the square root on both sides. You have plus or minus. Keep in mind that any time you use an even root to cancel out an even power, you have to remember the plus or minus. So plus or minus square root of x is equal to the square root of y squared. And that will simplify to y is equal to plus or minus square root of x. And so this means that y is equal to the square root of x, or y is equal to the opposite of square root of x. So notice that there is not just one function or one formula that's defining y as a function of x. There are two. So any particular x value that I find, I'm going to have two y values. It's not possible 
to solve for y uniquely. Because you have two different functions. And so this means no inverse function exists for f of x, which was x squared. So if you're not able to get y by itself and get just one function, one formula, instead of having two or more, then you do not have an inverse function. So the note, if you ever have a plus or minus that comes up when you're solving the equation for y to find the inverse function, then you do not have an inverse function. So we can use a few solutions to the quadratic function to illustrate numerically that you do not have an inverse. Okay, Keep in mind that the f of x equals x squared is still a function, it just it will not have an inverse function. So the top line is y equals x squared, or f of x equals x squared. If you substitute in negative 2, you get y value is 4. Negative 1, you plug it in, you get positive 1 for y. x equals 1 gives you y equals 1, and x equals 2 gives you y equals 4. Well, for the inverse relation, you interchange all the x's and the y's. So x is equal to negative 2. For the original function, well, that becomes an output value for the inverse. And y equals 4 becomes an input value for the inverse. So you, now you have all four of those points become 4, negative 2, 1, negative 1, 1, 1, and 4, 2. We'll look at the bottom line. This is for the inverse relation. Every single x must have exactly one output or one y value to be a function. Notice that 4 corresponds to negative 2 and 4 corresponds to positive 2. So the inverse relation is not a function. Same reason for positive 1. 1 corresponds to negative 1 and 1 corresponds to 1. So again, it would not be a function. So the function f would be the set of ordered pairs, negative 2 comma 4, negative 1 comma 1, 1 comma 1, and 2 comma 4. This is a function since every element in the domain corresponds to exactly one element in the range. But if you write the inverse relation, that would be 4, negative 2, 1, negative 1, 1, 1, and positive 4, comma, 2. Well, we know that this is not a function. So we cannot use the notation f inverse because it's not a function. And it's not a function since the input value I'm just going to use the number 1 this time, corresponds to two different output values. And they are negative 1 and 1. So if it's a function, you should only have one output for every single input. And so this bottom line is not a function. So if you look at the order pairs from that previous page, the order pairs on the bottom row does not give us a function. We saw that just a second ago. Is there a way that you can look at the graph and tell the exact same thing? Can you figure out whether a function will have an inverse by looking at the graph? And it turns out you can. So the horizontal line that's, that's given is the line y equals 4. So the y values are always 4 on this horizontal line. And notice that this line intersects the graph f of x equals x squared. 
in more than one point. Now what does that mean? Well, if you have y equals 4, the y values are the input for the inverse. So if you're inputting 4 into the inverse function, you should only have one output value. Well, if it hits the graph more than once, you have an output of 2, and you would have an output of negative 2. So no inverse function would exist because you have more than one output value. And so that's how you can use what's called the horizontal line test. So let's talk about what it actually says. It works exactly like the vertical line test, except you're using horizontal line instead. So it says a function will have an inverse function, and it's denoted f inverse, if there is no horizontal line that can be drawn that intersects the graph of the function more than one point. So if it's possible to draw a horizontal line that crosses the graph or intersects the graph more than one point, then no inverse function exists. So let's look at example four. Using the horizontal line test is just as quick as using the vertical line test. So example four says, which of the following graphs represents functions that have inverse functions? Well, the first graph, this is a linear function or a straight line. It is a function and it will have an inverse. So an inverse function will exist because the graph passes the horizontal line test. So any horizontal line I draw will hit the graph no more than one time. Now, if you have a parabola, whether the parabola opens up or this time it opens down, no inverse function exists. Because if I draw a horizontal line, any horizontal line I draw has to cross only one time to, be an, to have an inverse function. Well, if I draw a horizontal line here, it intersects the graph more than once. It fails the horizontal line test. Same thing for the third graph. If I draw a horizontal line, I can intersect the graph more than one time. So it intersects three times here, so, so this function does not have an inverse, nor does this function have an inverse. And then the last graph, this function does pass the horizontal line test, so an inverse function does exist. And it's because it passes the horizontal line test. So you might be wondering what's, what's so great about the horizontal line test. Well, let's say you don't want to go through all four steps of how to find an inverse by just doing all the work and you find out you can't get y by itself in step three. If you look at the graph first, then you'll know which of the functions will actually have an inverse before you even start the four-step process. So it turns out that there's a name for functions that have inverse functions. So functions that pass the horizontal line test, or functions that have inverses, they are called one-to-one. -one. So in other words, that means one x value will have exactly one y value to make it a function, and every single y value will have exactly one x value. That makes it an inverse function exist as well. So one-to-one -one functions is just another way of saying that a function will have no more than one x value for one y value or one y value for any x value. So if two y values are the same, the x values must be the same too. And why is this so important? It's because only one-to-one -one functions have inverse functions. So this means that any function that passes the horizontal line test, they are called one-to-one -one functions, and they will also have an inverse function. So let's look at the last thing in this section. How do you actually find the graph of an inverse function?
So there's a relationship between the graph of a one-to-one -one function and its inverse function. And the idea comes from the, the idea that we talked about previously of interchanging the x's and the y's to find the inverse function. Well, you can do the same thing with graphing as well. That will give you a method to find the inverse function's graph from the graph of the original function. And here's the idea. Suppose that a comma b is a point on the graph of a one-to-one -one function. So a function that will have an inverse. And that function is called f. So if you plug in a into your function f, the output is b. So you can write it this way. f of a equals b. Well, if there is an inverse function, that means you can input b and you can get a for your inverse. So that means if you input b into your inverse function, your output will be the value a. Well, you can write that as a point. Input b, output a. So that's b comma a as a point on the graph of the inverse function. And it turns out that you can do that for every single point on the graph of f. So let's look at the figure. So let's look at the graph that's in blue, or this graph that's increasing from left to right. Okay, notice that there's a point a comma b that's plotted on this graph. Well, if you interchange the a and the b, the input and the output, you will get the point b comma a on the graph of the inverse function. So this b comma a is on the inverse graph, which is this green graph. So let's give an example. Let's say the point 2 comma 3 is on this graph of f of x. What point would be on the graph of the inverse? Well, it would become 3 for the input, because 3 would be out, is the output for f, and 2 is the output because 2 is the input for f of x. And you can also do this for the y-intercept. 0 comma b is the y-intercept here. If I interchange the x's and the y-coordinates, then I get an x-intercept, which would be at b comma 0. So if you do this for every single point on this graph that's in blue, you're going to find out that the graph that's the inverse is a mirror image across a line of symmetry. So there's the symmetry, or there's the reflection for that point. Here's the reflection for a comma b. And then this is the reflection for 2 comma 3. There's a line of symmetry that's the line y equals x. So this is a symmetry line. For the graphs of f of x and the inverse function, f inverse of x. So in other words, if you have the graph f of x, you can find the inverse graph by reflecting across the line y equals x. And so for the last example, example 5, we are going to graph the inverse function when we're given the graph of the original function f of x. And we're going to graph the two functions in the same coordinate plane. All right, so let's make our coordinate plane first. So y-axis, x-axis, and it does help to draw in the line of symmetry. So this dashed line is the line y equals x, or the symmetry line between the two functions. So here's the graph of the original function. Your original function will pass through the point 0, negative 4, which is the y-intercept. It will pass through 1 comma negative 3, 2 comma 0, which is the x-intercept, and then 3 comma 5. And so the graph of f of x looks like this, with an arrow on the end. We're going to graph the inverse function by using every single point on the graph of f. So if 0 comma negative 4 is on the original function, then negative 4 comma 0 is on the inverse. And this would become an x-intercept instead of a y-intercept. 1 negative 3 would be negative 3 comma 1 on the inverse. 
2 comma 0 is an x-intercept for the original function. 0 comma 2 would be a y-intercept for the inverse function. And then 3 comma 5 would become 5 comma 3. And so the inverse function will have a graph that looks like this. So notice that these two graphs should be symmetric with respect to line y equals x. This point where the two lines intersect, that should be on the line y equals x, if all the tick marks are evenly spaced. And so this original function is f of x equals x squared subtract 4, and it's given as x is greater than or equal to 0. So the domain of the original function is bracket 0 to infinity, and the range is from negative 4 for your y values to infinity. Well, the inverse function would have the complete opposite. The inverse function would have a domain negative 4 to infinity, just like it is in the graph, and the range of the inverse would be 0 to infinity, just like it is in the graph. So this finishes up our discussion on inverse functions, how to find inverse functions using the four-step process, how to use the horizontal line test, and then also how to graph the inverse function given the original function. If you have any questions about any of the examples in this video, please let me know. And if you have any questions while you work on the homework in terms of inverse functions, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about solving linear equations.